Hi, I'm Liz Hadley. I'm a professor in the Department of Biology at Stanford University. This is part two of my iBiology talks. And what I want to talk to you about is the tiger. And the tiger is a species on the brink of extinction. I want to talk a little bit about some ideas that we've developed uh, in my lab about how we might try and rescue them. So tigers are in decline. The number of tigers on the planet has decreased dramatically since the 1970s when there were over 35,000 uh, wild tigers. You can see here the Central Asian tiger went extinct in the 70s and the 80s, the Java tiger, the South China tiger extinct in the 1990s. So we see that as habitat shown in blue declines, as do the tiger numbers. So today we're left with just 3,000 tigers in the wild. Um, one of the problems with small numbers of tigers is that they're separated into, into different populations, and I'll show you a little more about that in a second. But that means that tigers in these tiny populations, um, even the large ones have maybe 80 individuals, are mo more prone to local extinction because of stochastic fluctuations in their numbers or particular climate events. And that means that even maintaining just a few more um, individuals in tiger populations is, is really important for the preservation and survival of that population. In fact, there are more tigers that exist in zoos than exist in the wild. There are 3,000 wild tigers and over 5,000 that exist in zoos. The historic range of tigers has declined dramatically. This was their uh, range shown in green. They occupied most of South and East Asia. So their present range, shown in dark green here, is just a fragment of that. In fact, there's only 7% of tiger historic range that remains uh, for tigers today. And you'll note that the tiger populations are pretty separate from each other. Why is that? It turns out that there's humans living in this environment, and they're farming the environment. And it turns out that tigers avoid humans. And so in purple, we see the distribution of crop and pasture land in Asia. And if you look closely at the present range of tigers, you'll see that they tend to be found where crops and pastures are not. Also, tigers avoid people in particular. So this is the population density of humans in Asia, shown in dark blue. And what you'll see also, if you focus on the present tiger range, is they tend to be found where there aren't a lot of people. So these tiger subspecies are also, as I said, they're separated from each other, and they also have uh, unique genotypes. Now, they're not evolutionary very divergent. In fact, they're pretty recent because, as I, sh I said to you, they're population uh, distribution, their range has decreased so dramatically very recently, but the tigers, these tiger populations don't maintain a lot of genetic diversity. Most of the genetic diversity of tigers is maintained in India, you know, dramatically, it, very interesting considering that India is one of the most densely populated uh, parts on, of the planet. But it's important that none of these, what we call tiger subspecies, the Bengal tiger, Siberian tiger, Indo-Chinese tiger, Sumatran and Malayan, actually can, can move between them. They can't move between each other. So do we need to preserve these unique types of tigers, these subspecies? In fact, they do maintain slightly different morphologies, different behaviors. They're adapted to slightly different environments. And one of the questions um, is whether or not that's an important thing to maintain. It, in the past, and, and very often, this is argued to be, uh, it, this is strongly argued for. The reason is in part because the Bengal tiger is almost entirely found in India. India likes its tigers. The same is true for these other tigers. They're kind of owned by these different countries. So they're not separate species, but they are maintained and managed in slightly different ways. So these tiger populations are locally adapted, but remember the climates are changing. And it turns out that where tigers exist in South and East Asia is they're among the most vulnerable environments to climate change. So those, those in vulnerable populations then will need to move. They'll need to find genotypes and phenotypes that are better adapted to the climates of the future. And by preventing movements of these individuals between these populations, you're less likely to maintain those kinds of diverse uh, tools in their repertoire.
So to maintain that toolkit, it's important to consider uh, gene flow or moving individuals between populations. So what you'll see on the x-axis is population size, and what you'll see is on the y-axis is heterozygosities, which is a measure of genetic diversity. So for the same population size, you can actually increase the amount of genetic diversity you have by increasing um, migration between populations. So this migration or this gene flow is really important for rescuing genetic diversity within populations. So we set out to address the question, what's the impact of basically maintaining small genetically depauperate tiger populations without gene flow between them. So the way we did this is we looked at what the historic population size was, over 60,000 even as recently as um, the early part of the century. We, we then modeled that by looking at present population size and asked what happens in the future if we increase gene flow or if we maintain the populations as separate the way they are today. Are the tiger populations able to recover in some future point, or will they go extinct? So what we did is we used coalescent theory, slightly tweaking it with a model developed in my lab using serial data or temporal data. And what we were doing is, what we asked for is we looked at what present genetic diversity is shown here in these black marbles. And what we do is we just assume in coalescent theory that all existing genotypes or individuals in a population that show variation have some common ancestor back in time. So here's what that looks like. So in the present, we see that these two individuals, or genotypes, merged to have the same parent genotype just one generation ago. And we can iteratively model this back in time, showing that every one of the present uh, individuals had some common ancestor back in time. What influences that? So here you see that each one of these uh, colors indicates some sort of genotype in the individuals. And you'll see that we have red, red genotype, red genotype, and at some point back in time, red and blue were the same. And so how do you get from one genotype to the next? You do that through mutations. So we can look at a species-specific rate of mutation using this coalescent model, and we can add things like migration or movements of individuals between populations, and using different samples in time, we can assess how long it takes to coalesce back to the single common ancestor. And this is what is called Bayesian coalescent modeling using serial data, looking at multiple time points back um, to assess how long it takes to accumulate the diversity that we see today. What we did in our uh, model is actually we turned it around and we asked, given relatively low genetic diversity, but using different levels of migration, how fast and how long will it take to recover or to uh, assemble uh, some sort of diversity into the future? So the way to think about that is uh, going back to our marble model here with genotypes shown initially, we see a lot of variation. We take some subsample of that, we end up with a population bottleneck. Now, we can recover the numbers of individuals by increasing population size, but we can't recover the initial starting genetic diversity because genetic diversity takes time because we have to wait for mutation to accumulate. However, if we look at a separate population, again, starting from the same initial one, a separate grab of those marbles, we see that there's some slight differences in the genetic diversity of those individuals. And then when we recover those, we see that the recovery populations are very distinct. They're different from each other, and they each maintain, in this case, unique uh, kinds of genotypes in them. So what we asked is, what happens if we merge those two populations and then recover? So again, we're still not likely to go back to the initial population diversity because we've already lost so much of it. But what happens? Um, can we recover a substantial amount of our starting genetic diversity? So in particular, we started with asking just in one single habitat fragment, how many tigers would you need to, to recover even or to maintain the genetic diversity that exists in this case in a tiger reserve in the western ghats of, of uh, southern India. And it turns out that if you model that into the future, to the year 2150, we need to have an enormous population size. 
Uh, this is not a population size that these tiny preserves in the Western Ghats can maintain. We went further and asked whether or not we should interbreed subspecies. So we asked what the effect would be of adding these different genotypes together into a single pool of tiger diversity. And first we asked whether we should blend Eastern and Western populations. And then we asked whether we should interbreed all of these subspecies. And when you do something like that, it's called panmixia. It means that every individual tiger in the wild tiger populations is as equally likely to breed with another tiger individual anywhere, no matter where it's from. All populations are then modeled as one single population. So here's what we found. When we looked at panmixia, what I just explained, where every tiger is equally likely to breed with each other, and we go also to 2150, what you see is we don't need to come nearly as close to these enormous population sizes that we had as recently as uh, the 1970s. We can maintain the genetic diversity that existed historically. We can actually recover a little bit of that um, by just interbreeding individuals in these populations. However, when we um, limit the number of populations, in this case, uh, five, uh, sorry, two populations and up to five populations, you need to recover so many more tigers, it's far beyond the space that even historic populations occupied. There's absolutely no way we, we could recover this number of tigers. Remember, most of this part of the world is dominated by humans, and tigers can't live there. So timing matters as well. It turns out that if we wait just a little bit, because tigers have a long generation time, turns out that some of these older tigers that are starting to senesce maintain genotypes that will be lost if they die. So if we wait just a few years, we're going to need uh, to reach historic population sizes that are, are just not even possible. We can stall that, um, that loss of genetic diversity by, by acting immediately. So what does acting mean? So acting means getting these individual tigers together somehow. And so one, what I've described to you is what's called gene flow, or admixture, migration. However, how do we do that when there's no connection between the populations? Uh, they can't move naturally on their own between these different parts of the world. So how do we do it? One way is something called assisted migration. And it just means getting a tiger in a truck or on a plane and moving it to another population. That's an expensive endeavor, but clearly something like that is, got, is important for the future of, of tigers. Another way to do it is what we do with most of our livestock today, and it's artificial insemination. Again, highly interactive with those tigers. These kinds of decisions are not easy to make, but we've shown with our uh, with our models that it's a really critical thing to start considering and considering immediately if we are to preserve uh, tigers into the future. So the implications for the tiger about this, these, this information is that we still need to increase population size. There's no way around the fact that we need to get more individuals uh, on the ground. But that's not enough to preserve all of this genetic diversity, these toolkits we need for the future. Gene flow, or moving these individuals around in some way, could alleviate the loss of diversity. Because, uh, and, and because habitat corridors aren't possible, we are going to have to help the tigers move around, the tigers and their genotypes. So I have to say our future is worth crafting well. We have to anticipate these kind of changes. We have to think differently about what a wild species mean. If we means if we really care about the survival of that species. And I'll point out the tiger has turned out many years in a row to be the world's most favorite animal. To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering, a quote from Aldo Leopold, meaning that every individual tiger is worth saving for something we may not even anticipate. So with that, I'd like to thank all the former and current members of my lab, my collaborators, funding agencies, and Stanford University.